My name is John Shaw. I'm the director of the Public Policy Institute. And usually at this part of the program, I introduce the guest speaker. But having watched her for the last 45 minutes, I think she might want to introduce me to all of you. Uh, as I walked her, watched her moving from table to table and shaking hands, it's like, gosh, I think she's sort of done this before, <laughs> once or twice. Um, the ambassadors had this amazing 40-some year uh, history of diplomacy and public affairs that we're all eager to learn more about this afternoon. Um, Ambassador Harriet Elam uh, Thomas grew up in Boston, studied at Simmons College and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And she's had this amazing uh, career in diplomacy, serving the United States, representing the United States in Senegal, the Ivory Coast, Mali, Greece, Belgium, and Turkey. Uh, she was our ambassador in Senegal and retired as a career minister. Uh, she's going to speak about civility and public affairs, and she, she, she brings to this experience, um, or this perspective, you know, years of experience, but she also practices what she preaches. As at the Institute, we organize a lot of speakers, and the ambassador has been amazingly courteous and kind and responsive to every one of my staff. They're like, man, how come not every speaker is quite this easy? So she has certainly shown uh, what civility and respect and professionalism is all about. She She's written a wonderful memoir about her experiences called Diversifying Diplomacy. We, D Diversifying Diplomacy. We have some copies out in the front, and she will be glad to sign any copies after the talk if you're interested. And as I read her book, there was so much that was interesting and, and, and compelling to draw on. I, I was struck by one comment she made that, in which she said, nothing of life in America escapes notice in other nations underscoring the fact that what we do in our example still resonates very wi widely in the world for good or ill. So that, uh, that is very profound. And I was also liking, I loved her, her, her reflections on leadership and when she said the best leaders are sincere and humble. Real leadership has to do with integrity and performance. Neither one can take a holiday. They reflect on your character and soul. Um, in addition to her book, I, I did a little uh, research on the internet about her and came across an, inter an interview she did with the uh, group called History Makers and learned some things that are probably not hugely relevant but kind of interesting. Her favorite color is yellow, I learned. Um, her favorite food is ice cream. We went to Newell House last night, I can confirm that. Um, her favorite time of year is spring. Fortuitous as we arrive. I think the first day of spring is today or tomorrow. Um, her favorite vacation venue is Paris. Not a bad choice. I thought you might say Peoria, but. Uh, <laughs> and her favorite saying, I think, which is really touching, it says, You never touch someone so lightly that, they, that you do not leave a trace. So with that, we will bring it forward. Ambassador. Talk about hosting with the most, or the hostess with the most, or, or hosting a, a speaker. This institution is taken being welcoming to another level. And I go to a lot of universities, and I've been to a lot of um, places that are not higher educational institutions. And the, the organization is sort of slipshod sometimes. And I get a call from Mark Robinson saying, I'm here, but there's a little traffic, and I'll get to you. And I'm saying, I didn't get my number. And then he appears. I describe what I look like. And the rest is two hours of a conversation that led to his bringing his daughter here today. So I'm really touched by that. Where were you, Marley? <laughs> yes, she is. Yes, she is. A new diplomat who knows more about narwhals than I would ever know. And I must say that a little child shall teach us. Sound familiar? Well, on the 12th of January, I attended the memorial or the funeral of one of my colleagues, one of my mentees, who now has the nerve to be 70. Her mother was 94 years old. And as we sat there amongst 700 guests in Maryland, Silver Spring, Maryland. The Reverend Alice, Muriel Alice Fitzjohn, who was originally from Sierra Leone, was the wife of the Sierra Leonean ambassador to the US and to the UK. 
had to have been an exceptional human being. We attended my husband and I, her 90th birthday party, and I was honored to read the letter of congratulations, they do this for 90-year-olds now, from President Obama four and a half years ago. But as her daughter read her bio, her obituary, she said, my mother graduated from SIU in 1969. Then at age 44, Reverend Fitzjohn received her degree the very same year that her daughter graduated from college in Napier, Napierville? Napierville. SIU asked then Reverend Fitzjohn to serve as an international ambassador to promote SIU on the continent of Africa. She cherished that responsibility because of the genuine hospitality, civility, and warmth of the Carbondale community. And I saw some of that already from my only less than 48 hours here. What I'm saying is that relationships endure when they're built on trust, respect, and civility. And I was so touched by that SIU connection, I wanted to share the unexpected coincidence with you prior to my presentation, because it says something very special about Southern Illinois University. And all of the students and alumni here, you're very, very fortunate to be connected with this institution. So now let me move on to the matter at hand, civility in public affairs at home and abroad. Siri, please set my alarm for 9 a.m. Siri, I do not understand. Siri, set alarm for 9 a.m. Okay, alarm set. Alexa. Please turn on WMFE. Repeat command, Alexa says. Repeat command. I do not understand. Turn on WMFE. OK, playing WMFE. So I think you know where I might be going with this. We give commands without any reference to politeness. The mere fact that I put please in front of that command through the computerized voice recognition, whatever, off. Time is of the essence, and who has time to be polite, caring, or respectful? And one of the many definitions of civility is claiming and caring for one's identity's needs and beliefs without degrading someone else in the process. I'm sure that many of you have witnessed a sea change in the manner in which certain leaders communicate. Trust me, in diplomacy, civility counts. I've witnessed how civil discourse worked to build America's image abroad, but I'll also admit that I'm, no, I'm kind of glad that I'm no longer an active diplomat trying to explain the current trends in American political discourse today. Fortunately, I served during the careers of ambassadors like Thomas Pickering, Terence Todman, Edward Perkins, William Burns, Ruth Davis. They are all career ambassadors, which has the equivalent military rank of four-star generals. I'm only a three-star folk. I observed their interactions with others of any rank, and I marveled at their ability to connect. So I ask you to relax and gain comfort because there's no real need to panic. There are senior and mid-level career diplomats working in our embassies and consulates who continue to build sincere relationships with our international hosts. Several of my former UCF students who are now career diplomats posted abroad, they keep me abreast of their work. And they would make every one of us in this audience today proud. They are bright, far less judgmental than my generation, and they're concerned about the plight of the least fortunate who deserve a fair chance to make a positive difference in their worlds. 
The University of Central Florida has been my professional home for the past 16 years. I came back from Senegal as a diplomat in residence, to be a diplomat in residence for one year. I ended up spending 16 years. They asked me to stay a second year to be a diplomat in residence, and there's something called a timeout, so to speak, for career diplomats. You have to retire at 65. So I retired, and then I began teaching diplomacy, and they asked if I would establish a diplomacy program, a certificate, and then the program. And so here I am, 16 years later, when anybody in their right mind ought to be fully retired. As I interact with the students in classrooms or now more as a career advisor, I'm heartened by this generation. They are actively involved in minimizing human trafficking, protecting the environment, accepting individuals of all races, ethnicities, gender orientations, orientation, and religions. These students, despite the often negative media coverage of millennials, give me hope for the future, because they really are not self-centered. They are not just as judgmental as I was at their age. They are courteous. And from my experience, and I say mine, they embodied civility and respect. And they also inspired me to share with you the concept of what I cover in my recently published memoir, Diversifying Diplomacy, My Journey from Roxbury to Dakar. Do many of you know the t where Roxbury is? Oh, that's right, you would. Yes, it's, I, I purposely have Roxbury and not Boston in the title. So for those of you who don't know, it is the predominantly black area, we were Negroes then, of Boston, Massachusetts. And as I said to someone earlier, the house in which I lived is now a condo to the t costing $300,000. It's all gentrified. Uh, I couldn't afford to live there any longer. But my career was and continues to be built upon civility, authenticity, and respect. As an African-American woman with a passion for cultural matters, as well as an abiding interest in the intersections of distinct cultures, I frequently found myself in an anomalous position during my long career abroad. In all of my assignments, I was charged with representing and describing American society to foreign publics. I was pleased and honored to take on that responsibility, which I considered an almost sacred trust. There's nothing quite like the realization that for the people you meet overseas, you are the United States of America. From the beginning and consistently throughout my career, I strove to make sure that the image of the United States that my host gained was accurate and substantive. In our business, we frequently use the term showing the flag. I believe I showed the flag with enthusiasm from Dakar to Athens to Istanbul, Brussels, and then when I returned 28 years later to Dakar as the US ambassador. That same, the same society that I represented, however, was one in which racism played an all too pervasive role, and I didn't really see it demonstrating genuine civility. When I entered the Foreign Service in 1963, the number of minorities in positions of authority, like the number of women, was abysmally low. Furthermore, American culture was generally associated with the prevailing white culture of the time, notwithstanding the fact that policymakers had recognized the universal appeal of certain aspects of American cultural achievement. The dominant role of African Americans in jazz, for example, was the highlighted in the officially supported cultural events around the world Nevertheless, I found myself to be the spokesperson for a nation that had not come to terms with its own richness, its extraordinary cultural diversity, or indeed its own complexity. Now, I wrote these thoughts in 1998 as I was leaving the US Information Agency and handing the keys to Secretary Madeleine Albright. 
However, when I reflect on these topics two decades later, I am sobered by the fact that these reflections remain all too relevant today. For 40 years of my adult life, I navigated a host of different gestures that meant something very different from my adolescent roots in Roxbury, Massachusetts. I listened to my counterparts and gained a more accurate grasp of non-Western values. Language fluency was critical, for it enhanced mutual understanding and respect listening attentively and speaking in another's language heightened my credibility as a U.S. diplomat. Now, while we think we've known all that is necessary in mastering a language, knowing the culture is also vital. I must say that I am often motivated by Nelson Mandela's most powerful quote, if you speak to a person in a language he or she knows, you speak to his head. If you speak to a man in his language, you speak to his heart. Implicit in Mandela's quote are the concepts of civility, respect, politeness, honesty, and courtesy. He exemplified statesmanship. He exemplified leadership. Becoming culturally competent during my various assignments allowed me to build lasting relationships with my interlocutors. I noted how the attention all of a sudden became even more intense when I spoke their native tongue. The, the stress and the skepticism as they looked at this American almost immediately diminished. In so doing, I gave respect to them and I earned their trust. Imagine how f much fun it would be having a dinner and you've got the interpreter here and everything you say, you've got to wait for the interpreter to say it to your host. That line of communication is totally broken and there's no way you're going to have a, a, a genuine intimate conversation with your host or hostess. So by earning their trust, I felt that Americans would perhaps learn that in most societies abroad, one has to be completely honest and be genuinely interested in their hosts. In that manner, we're going to be far more effective in gaining their support for the United States positions at the United Nations or any other multilateral organiza organization. We will succeed, as I finally did, to have an open skies agreement placed on the parliamentary agenda in Senegal if we, as I did, establish a sincere rapport with the Vice President of the National Assembly. He is now 96, and 2016, my husband and I returned to Senegal, and in his frail health, he was the first person to attend a luncheon in our, in our honor. I left Senegal in 2003, it's a long time. But that vice president of the National Assembly felt that it was important for open skies to be indeed considered by their parliament, not knowing that I had been pressured by the FAA to do that for months and months and months. I worked on that relationship. But it proved valuable, and it proved worthy of my time. Time. Did I say time is often of the essence, and that's why we don't take time to build relationships? The fact that I was asked also to go and present the America's case to an editorial board at a Turkish newspaper, which had written we had fed terrorists, was one that stands out always in my mind in, when it comes to establishing a rapport. I called the editorial board in advance and said the ambassador had asked me to come and talk to them about what they had written, that we were feeding PKK terrorists. That is a northern Turkish group, mainly of Kurdish descent, and America would never do such a thing. But because I spoke Turkish, I went appropriately dressed to a meeting of the editorial board, and the paper happened to be a particularly fundamentalist Turkish newspaper.
But I think the fact that I conducted the entire meeting in Turkish threw them off guard, and they printed an apology in the Turkish newspaper the next day. Guess who got promoted that year? <laughs> and I hadn't been promoted the four years I was in Greece. But it said something, too, about respecting them and their culture. Because there sure were no other women in the room. I also, though, had to learn lessons. I, I invited a driver to be in the meeting with us in the Ivory Coast when I was a very junior diplomat to discuss the visitor of, a, of an American speaker under our speaker program abroad. Well, my staff, truly, they were not happy with me. They said, we do not sit in a room with the drivers. Now, the driver was bilingual, was going to the airport to pick up the speaker, and knew more about the program than most of the people because he had been with me in the car all the time. I said, you don't disrespect him. They said, you Americans try to democratize everything. And at 31 years old, or even younger, I, I guess I was trying to be a bit too civil, but I learned a lesson that I couldn't superimpose my values on another culture. It was a sobering experience, but I learned, and I didn't make that mistake again. I did a paper on it when I was in graduate school. Incivility seems to be omnipresent today. However, there are still rays of hope. And I heard an uplifting story on the news on NPR where an American soldier said that his Afghan interpreter saved his life. And when he asked the interpreter, why did you do this? The Afghan responded, because you are a guest in my country. Americans have a lot to learn, even today. And so before I get to my next point, I went to Denmark to prepare for the joining of USIA to the State Department. And my American colleagues, all of whom are blonde-haired and I could have said blue-eyed, said something about those Danes. And that's when I realized it's not a color thing. It's an American arrogance that we have that's prevalent around the world. Those people, I said, wait a minute. We cannot have an embassy in any country without the host government approving that the embassy can open. You cannot refer to your Danish colleagues as those people. They may not have been happy to hear that, but that's the only way we'll be effective as diplomats anywhere around the world. Our challenge to enhance civil discourse in today's society is doubly difficult because often social media allows one to be unkind, uncaring, and yes, insulting. In a TED talk, a young woman named Gabrielle Bosch says, we use technology to solve problems constantly, and yet we also use it to avoid conflict. Certainly the loss of empathy from anonymous interactions is a major factor. However, the real root of the problem is how we view our time online. Many of us see it as a break from our real lives, a place we can let it all hang out, in our offline lives, we know we must be civil, or we ought to be civil, and refrain from telling colleagues what we really think, or telling our bosses what we really think, and how we truly feel. And the anger from that restraint strength builds inside of us, and as a result, online conversations seem to free us from consequences. Our world is spending more and more time online, and for many, it has become the major source of education, entertainment, communication, and debate. So it's time to let go of the false wall between our online selves and our real lives. We need to act with the same kind of civility in both arenas. Because our history provides us with vivid lessons that give us cause for resilience to face the future. Remember the immediate aftermath of 9-11. Do you remember the 
the um, Yankee Stadium tribute. Every religion was represented on that podium. And people were civil to one another. Terrorist attacks on churches, synagogues, and mosques. People will come together, but the community cohesion in the aftermath of such events, sadly, is short-lived. Recent examples of US passengers being disrespected on airlines and Starbucks, Warfel houses, Airbnbs. Well, Starbucks' May 29th initiative last year to address unconscious bias is a much needed first step. However, bias is insidious. And it is time for Starbucks to look deeply at its own relationship with racial violence. It is just the first step in a long path to re reconfirm the value of respect. But I do commend Starbucks for the initiative because they play the role of statesmanship in that private sector. Recent acts and of what we call random acts of kindness illustrate that all is not lost in today's world. Many of you remember last May when the young Malian immigrant scaled a building in Paris to save the life of a four-year-old toddler. He understood the value of a human life. He respected it, and through that act, he demonstrated his civility. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, responded in kind and offered the young Malian an expedited path to citizenship. So as we reflect on our history, our image abroad during the height of the Cold War was far from positive. Statesmen seemed few and far between early on in that area, era. The Soviets used horrific images of the mistreatment of African Americans in the South in their very effective propaganda against the United States. It seems that the Russians are still pretty astute in today's digital world. The US Information Agency, where I served as acting deputy director, as I said until I handed the keys to Albright, sent Louis Armstrong, Dizzy Gillespie, Dave Brubeck, and others abroad to introduce a new face of America. While they succeeded in opening lines of communication to the Eastern Bloc, the civil rights movement reached a level that caused the artists to cancel their tour and return home. They exhibited their integrity their authenticity, and yes, their statesmanship. They could not continue to be abroad representing America, knowing what was happening in Birmingham and Arkansas. Most Americans of my generation will never forget the early history of the inhumane treatment of a host of minorities in America and the Holocaust in Germany. The present uncharitable mischaracterization of those attempting to enter the United States from our southern borders brings back disturbing memories. Despite the inevitable challenges, I have to remain the eternal optimist because effective leaders in all disciplines still exist and we need to increase their media coverage. How sad that we have to wait for the funerals of John McCain or President George Herbert Walker Bush to remind us of the value of men who exuded civility, respects, and statesmanship throughout their lives. We, too, can move forward in today's own environment. But before I move to that, I must tell you, as a junior diplomat, at the United Nations, I received a note from President George Herbert Walker Bush on one of his three by, what are you going to, five by eight cards when he was the permanent rep to the UN in 1971. I had written a report about youth delegations to the UN in 1971. And I was saying that you really don't pay very much attention to what young people have to say. He said, I've read your report that you've given to Ambassador Zagorian, and I understand it, I found it to be very good. Then, 20 years later, when President Bush came to Istanbul, Turkey, 
There I was as the director of the press and public, public affairs section of the consulate. And he wrote another note saying, how nice to see you again. Does this penmanship look similar to the one 20 years ago? I meant to bring them with me, and when he passed, the retired career diplomat sent out a note saying, did any of you have interactions with President George Bush? And, and all of us wrote, and that was truly my shining hour. I will cherish those handwritten notes that others far more important have received than I. But as I said, we can, started to say, we can move forward in today's society if we're careful about our language and the tone of voices we've used. Have you seen parents really screaming at their children in a way that it really is not humane? How can you expect a child to respond to someone who says, you're a bad child? The child may be naughty, but don't put that heavy word and that the title on a, an infant or a child who has no idea how to, to ferret out what the parent truly means. Also, if we listen with empathy, without assuming we know what our interlocutor is going to say in response. We also must recognize that digital games may inform, but they may not always improve our worldview. And we also need to remember women and minorities should not only focus on being victims of discrimination, but rather be prepared and confident in our own professions. I see one young woman who is in STEM who's just left, but you tell her for me that I was very proud to make her acquaintance this afternoon. Because in my day, no one looking like her wearing a skirt would be studying science, technology, engineering, or math. She, she had to go to class, but I remember. Exude the confidence that you gain, not arrogance, as you enter the room Command your presence. And always remember that a crucial measure of one's success in life is the way we treat one another in every day of our lives. In order to be civil, we need to be informed. We need to step back from a situation before passing judgment. Sadly, often the most negative aspect of an issue is the first we see on the news and to counter frequent and often intentional misperceptions of America in foreign media, I would offer people my personal experiences to enlighten the international audiences. What they may have seen on the surface was not the complete face of America. And what a beautiful face it can be. We cannot ask Alexi or Alexa, not Alexis, Alexa or Siri to have human qualities. But we can make a concerted effort to regain the missing connection that cultivates trust, civility, and leadership. Neither Alexa nor Siri could write the kind notes which I received from one Ambassador George Herbert Walker Bush and then President Bush. At the time when I was, pres as I said, head of press and public affairs, we all looked at then President Bush as truly a statesman of the highest order. He treated every Turkish member of the staff with dignity. They remembered that because they had worked for six weeks prior to his visit. 24, almost 24 seven, when a president comes, it's one thing with a CODEL, but when a president comes to visit you overseas, no time is yours for six weeks before the president walks into that embassy. So I would say that for me, one of the most important things we do in life, as he, President Bush, clearly showed, would be his manner in interacting with other human beings of any stature. The lady who cleans my office has a son going to the University of Chicago Medical School. She's of Latin American descent, and her name is Evelyn. I want to say to you that I don't think that many people in that building know who Evelyn is and what the heck her son is doing, but I do. Because my mother cleaned people's homes in Brookline, Massachusetts. And I went on the bus with her and saw these beautiful homes in Boston in an area that I never thought I would live. And to think that same mother 
was able to see her son become the fourth black judge and be sworn in with by the governor of Massachusetts years later. I think that was her shining hour. But the other is that there are insightful in observers of the human condition, and one is Peggy Tabor Millen. Her reflections remain seared in my memory. She says, I was on a train on a rainy day. The train was slowing down to pull into the station. For some reason, I became intent on watching the raindrops on the window. Two separate drops, pushed by the wind, merge with one another for one moment and then divided again, each of the drops carrying a part of the other. That, simply by that momentary touching, neither raindrop was what it had been before. And as each one went to touch other drain raindrops, it shared not only itself, but what it had gained and gleaned from the other. I realized then that we never touch people so lightly that we do not leave a trace. Our state of being manners, matters to those around us, so we need to become conscious of what we unintentionally share so that we can learn to share with intention. What is civility? What is statesmanship? What is leadership? If not a constant awareness that no human encounter is without consequence. We never touch others so lightly that we do not leave a trace. Thank you. Do you have time for a few Q&As? Is that why this is set up? up? I can do it from here. I will be very candid with you. Uh, I'm a retired diplomat, but I'm also very careful what I say because I still teach that art. So don't ask me a political question that I can't answer. Or I will be very good at obfuscating and giving you a diplomatic answer. And I'll move around. Oh, he's going to take it. Okay. I would actually come down and. John, can I come yeah. down? To, and walk around to get closer. I'll take this. What's working? It's That's when I'm not 12. <laughs> okay, now I've come closer to you. My, my question is, um, how many languages do you speak and what are they? Greek, French, and Turkish, and English. Sometimes. <laughs> wow. Some of you heard me say I learned Greek at 42 and Turkish at 47. So people who are older who say, oh, I can't do this. I'm too old. It's never too late. But I managed to get through the Turkish exam three weeks after I met Nelson Mandela. I was awestruck. And I said, if this man can set in 1990, stand up here for in front of a joint session of Congress and speak so eloquently without bitterness about American history, I can pass this Turkish exam. <laughs> so I went back and I had three more weeks and I was a hermit for those three weeks. But I wouldn't have been able to do what I did in Turkey or negotiate the payment for the Dance Theater of Harlem's performance in Athens to be televised around the country in Greek if I didn't learn Greek and convinced the members who wanted to, well, they wanted to pay $40,000 as opposed to $110,000, and they wanted to give it to Arthur Mitchell, the then director of uh, Dance Center of Harlem, in drachma. What was he going to do with Greek drachma in the United States? So it's little things like that. You, you know, if you've built a relationship with a community because you speak their language, they will open up to you even more than you would ever expect. And you learned that, as I said at the table before, Greek men are not as macho as they are when they're at home. Their wives take care of the money and everything else. <laughs> yes, sir. First, thank you for coming. Uh, 
A prominent Washington figure has described African nations in a profane way that I can't repeat here. I'd be interested in both your reaction, but also what reaction the African uh, elites would have. It doesn't have to be the elite. Huh? Because what? they are a lot more educated than we are in many ways. Uh, I think you're getting to the point where why are you going to make a mass generalization about one culture? First of all, there are 54 countries on the continent of Africa. And as Robin Wright, whom I respect, is really a Middle East expert, but she writes on foreign affairs in a lot of media and in Foreign Affairs magazine, she said, do you realize that most of the students who come to the United States are far more advanced in their education. They're coming here for masters and PhDs, and they know more about our culture than we know ourselves, and they could run rings around all of us. Uh, the media will show us the, char the Ebola crisis, the droughts in the Sahel region when I was first going to Africa in the late mid-80s or late 70s, early 80s. All of the, what we call, poverty porn. My students taught me that term, poverty pornography. So you're gonna show the flies all over the children and the, yes, we know there's starvation in certain parts of Kenya right now, but that's not the majority. Granted, it is the educated elite that comes to the United States who end up satisfying Harvard's requirement for diversity because they happen to have brown or black skin, and so you can say I've got a real diverse population. Half of them are from Nigeria, Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, Kenya. But when you say that a nation is not of value and it reaches the audience of the world because we used to be, I said, used to be the 800 pound gorilla that everybody looked to for a way in which to comport themselves. That is no longer the case. But you cannot survive if you're going to belittle others, as I said, humility, caring, and concern for the other is so important in order to be a leader, a statesman, or a stateswoman. So your question is well taken. It is not received with great warmth, as you might suspect. But the epitome of that is that one of their sons happened to be head of state of this 800-pound gorilla, which it was, once was. It is a very sad commentary on others when you have to tear someone else down to build yourself up. And I don't see that happening often in Africa. I keep meeting people who know more about economics and high tech than I do. Yes, again, they are the educated elite, but that's true of every country. But that's because people make the assumption that Africa is a country and not a continent. How many, time how many times have people said to you, I'm wearing African dress, and I would say, what country is that from? These are African Americans and white Americans because they don't understand that there's 54 countries. So we have a lot to learn. Thank you for your question. Yes. Hello. Hello. Thank you for coming and sharing your experience and You're honesty. Welcome. My question is, how did you remain uh, civil and authentic mm. in cultures who mischaracterize your true character? Very few cultures would mischaracterize me, but my own culture would. Is that what you're getting at? Uh, because they were really quick to see the value of what was in someone's mind and heart, and they never judged people by the color of their skin. I spent five, three weeks in Australia and never once did with five women of color, no one stared at us the f full three weeks we were there. No one turned ahead. And we thought, well, maybe we're invisible. But they could care less. It was not easy because one, as I said earlier, it was more difficult being female than being African American. So all of, many of you have seen the film Hidden Figures. So when the woman walks into the NASA 
lab with all the men in the white shirts, the computer brain of all. That was my life, only they had navy blue jackets on top of those white shirts. So if you've been the only woman in a room filled with men, and none of whom look like you, I'm not gonna say few, none looked like me, you had to find a way to feel comfortable in your own skin by using your intellectual prowess. And what really managed to keep me going is to be one step ahead of my bosses or one step ahead of the people were, with whom I was going to meet. I will not go to an event without doing all the necessary research on the person I'm going to meet. Because that person has done, now you can do that. That person has done the same about me, but there's going to be one or two nuggets in there. I find out that John Shaw has spent a year in Sydney, Australia. Now, if I hadn't done a little research, I wouldn't have known that, and we couldn't have talked about my husband's children and grandchildren being in Australia. That gives you a connection that you might not have had. But to be very honest with you, it has never been easy. But if I carried a chip on my shoulder by the way my country had treated me and my ancestors, then I could not have represented America very effectively abroad. I had to rise above that. Now, in my age group, I remember what happened when Bull, Bull Connor sprayed those children and sh set the dogs off on them. That picture is seared in my mind. For my students, black, white, Asian, Latino, they, they're too young. They don't know where Saigon is. They think it's a kind of spice. I kid you not. Vietnam War, what's that? These are 18 and 19 and 20 year olds, who, some of whom are here. And it's not their fault. But I can't carry that chip on my shoulder and be effective in lifting the next generation up. And there's always the, the gender aspect which comes in to play. I said to John and his wife last night, I gave us a presentation on culture and diplomacy using the arts and talking about Hamilton, uh, the song Happy, Pharrell Williams, and it was translated into many languages, and Iranian students were put in jail because they translated it into Farsi, because it was a little too free and forward look moving. I honestly, no, I lost my train of thought. That I, when I talked to you last night about music and the arts, well, that's, that'll tell you why I'm getting older. <laughs> I can't remember. When it comes back to me, I will tell you, but it, it illustrates, it was going to illustrate a point where you just can't carry that chip on your shoulder. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for uh, coming for the presentation. Um, if you can't comment on the French or the British um, uh, Brexit maneuvers or the yellow vests or the culture mm -hmm. of, yeah. let's call it urban um, separation from the regional politics, maybe I'll give you a, a US question instead, which is, uh, how do you get recruited into the State Department? And there's a formal process, for example, in the military having nominations from the House of Rep from your representative yeah. or having the regional Federal Reserve banks who recruit locally. How does the State Department recruit young people into the system? And do you think there should be a more regional uh, focus in that recruitment process? I became a diplomat in resident for precisely that reason. About 20 years ago, the Foreign Service realized that it didn't have a Foreign Service that looked like America 20, 25 years ago. And during the time of Colin Powell, they wanted to have a department of uh, diplomats who truly represented the breadth and, and, and diversity of this country. So the diplomats in residence are placed at institutions that are not Ivy League schools. They're in highly urban areas, first generation college goers. So University of Central Florida is a 68,000 students. A good 80% of them are first generation college goers, and now 49% are of Latin American or Latino descent. The Foreign Service, we, we look at young men and women, and then I'd go into a classroom and I'd say, I don't want all the white males to get up and walk out of the room because you're not, we're looking for somebody who's bringing a perspective from outside of Yale, Princeton, and Harvard 
Stanford, the West Coast, and Reed. We wanted to know what Middle America or some non-Ivy League institution represents. What is your perspective, your point of view? How are you going to sit down and negotiate an agreement with someone who only has an elitist background? And you're talking about the Turks and the Greeks or the Arabs and Israelis who, who really, if you put them all in a room, you couldn't tell the difference because they look the same. <laughs> They, they really do. The visuals, it's, 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 it's amazing how religion and, and ethnic, ethnic groups can divide people when you really can't tell, just looking at them. Well, the young men and women we try to select have to go through a written and an oral process. The written process is, they tell me, almost as frightening as the bar what is the bar exam that all lawyers have to take? So I took the exam twice. Several people who are very effective career diplomats have taken the Foreign Service exam two or three times. The daughter of one of my mentors took it three times until I, I gave the exam. I went around the country and I was on the board of examiners for a year before I went to the University of Central Florida after I came back from being ambassador. Young men and women would fly in from Hong Kong, from on their own nickel. And it was the most difficult year of my career because I had to tell them, unfortunately, your performance has not allowed us to continue your candidacy in the Foreign Service. Now, they have just flown from halfway around the world because they didn't know how to ratchet back the ego. They couldn't handle hypothetical situations, crisis situations. One was with the Guggenheim Museum in New York and had been a director of a major section of that museum. Others had been financial managers in the Far East, in Singapore or Hong Kong, but they had a desire for public service because it was right after the September 11th. It was two years after September 11th, and everybody was anxious to be doing, doing public service. Once you finish the Foreign Service written exam, you are given the oral. It's a seven hour exam of a case management study and then a negotiation se segment around a table with eight people that are reviewed by the examiners. We're sitting along the side to see how you react and how you're going to figure, it, figure out how much money or what project you're going to rec recommend to an ambassador to fund. The table is filled with young men and women of every race, color, and creed. So you've got a Latino who is not, not known to be quiet and retiring. You've got someone who is from East Asia who is very reserved. You've got a Caucasian American who may be really, you know, good Episcopalian or Lutheran or very quiet. Then you're going to have someone who might be African American who is a little more exuberant. How do you make a judgment on how they handle that negotiation if you are not taking time to put into your own mindset what cultural baggage he or she brings to that table? And so I would often say to the, those who set up the exam, you know we have to take this into consideration or else we're going to get the wrong people in the Foreign Service. They were not too happy with me initially, but then they realized well, maybe she has something there. But I had to do it without threatening my male counterparts. <laughs> but it, you pass the written and the oral. I said that's eight hours during a day. And then you have something called the suitability test. The suitability test goes through your police record to see if you've smoked marijuana. If you've smoked marijuana, it's all right now, but you need to say it. You need to be honest when you fill out that part of the exam. It's not unlike a security clearance, but it's done before you get through the final sort of level. And once you've been proven suitable to be in the Foreign Service, then you get the letter of a welcoming. We take in about 60, we used to, a year, and 3,300 people take the exam, all right? So it's meant to be elite. It's meant to be terribly competitive. But does that mean you're going to be more effective in negotiating with people? I'm convinced being African American in Turkey was an advantage because they felt that I understood their desire to become members of the European Union when they were the only Muslims who wanted to become a member of the Christian club of European nations. 
And they, they didn't quite say it to me, but they really would bear their soul to us because we were our, their hearts and souls. The United States was pushing for Turkey to become a member of the European Union. Well, that's not necessarily the case now. They're still not a member of the EU. But you can see how things like that can happen. I actually told the president of Senegal, a man who was African, 20 years older than I, you don't want the Europeans to think you can't run this country. Don't ask me where I got the nerve. But I did. And he listened and gave me his attention for about three minutes. But it's that kind of thing that you can bring to a negotiation that others may not. You can play on your femininity in one way or your race in another, but you have to be very careful how you do that. Ah, I remember what I was going to say. I spoke to the students about Hamilton and Pharrell's happy. And I, I, a young woman came up to me at the end, you heard this, with blue hair and lipstick and a very attractive dress with a James Earl Jones voice and said to me, would they allow me to be in the foreign service? Now, I am one of the most tolerant people on this God's earth because I've had people who didn't want to tolerate me. And I claim I'm non-judgmental, but we're all human, right? I looked at her and said, she's 6'2 with that voice. In 1963, they hired me. She was relieved. I left, and as I said to John and Mindy last night, two days later, I looked in my email, and there was a note from the State Department. We hired our first transgender management officer. I didn't tell a lie. I was, maybe I was clairvoyant. No, they probably had others, but no, they said that was the first. This was two days last March after I d delivered a presentation on cultural and, culture and diplomacy. So it's a very different world in which we live and have our being. And we all have to learn to remember that we never touch anyone so lightly that we do not leave a trace. So that your students can get back to work, I will say thank you ever so much to all of you. Well, Ambassador, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And she will be uh, signing books out back. So if, if you're thank interested. You for inviting me. Yes, thanks so much. And we will ha definitely have her back. So thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. Absolutely.